can bring you to tears thinking about that God would love you so much that he dies for you. And we're living in a time where Christianity is thinking, well, you know, God loves me, then give me this, that, and the other thing. No, that ain't love. You know, any pimp can do that, right? Give you this, that, and the other thing. But true love is seeing and giving yourself for someone else and someone that cannot repay you. And we can. We can give our life in service to God from here until the day we die, till we take our last breath, and it would come near enough of paying back God for what he did. Amen. Amen? So nobody can ever pay back God. You serve him because you love him. Right? Paul said, the love of Christ constraineth me. His love for me, my love for him, because I should love him after what he's done for me. I mean, rightfully, they could have just let all humanity die and go to hell, be done with it. But instead, he, try, he saves uh, sinful humanity, he saves sinful human beings. And then when he saves us, we still have to contend with this sin nature and this sin-cursed flesh, right? So he saves us knowing that we're not going to turn around and live perfect lives. We're going to blow it, right? Uh, we're still going to commit sins. We're still going to sin against him. But he encourages us. He says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I like the part where it says he's faithful and just. Faithful means he'll always forgive. Not sometimes, not halfway. He'll always forgive. Just means he's just in doing it because he gave his life. He gave his life for us to do that. Amen. He became the ultimate sacrifice. He became the living embodiment of whatever sacrifice in the Old Testament pointed to. He's our God and our Savior. And he's deserving of our love, deserving of us giving him our best. Amen. Our best. And, and you think about it, how many other people... You know, you might try to please or give your best to. You might want to try to give your best for your employer or for your teacher or, or for your spouse. But then when it comes to God, are you still with the same energy and endeavorment willing to give your best for God? I mean, we should be. We should be willing to give our best. We shouldn't be satisfied with the thought, well, I'm on my way to heaven and that's really all I'm concerned about. That time of that kind of thinking almost makes I don't like to question people's salvation, but that type of talk almost makes you want to want to question it. Do you do you really understand what happened here, and, and what's going on, and and the great length that God went to, and, and everything seems so so abstract for us, but putting it in its proper context, when you look at the universe. When you look at this world, you look at this creation, it did just happen. There, there was no evolution. That, that's a lie, so get that out of your mind. There, there was no evolution. There was no part evolution and then uh, panspermia where these aliens came, came and took these monkeys and juiced them up and now they became humans. That didn't happen either, amen? God created the monkeys, and God created man and, man and woman, and then they were never to crossbreed or meet. Amen? They were distinct creations. And so God, when we think about this salvation, and we think about what God done for us, we've got to understand who is, who is he? Who is he? He's the God that's spoken into existence. And guess what? He did it roughly 6,000 years ago. Not billions and billions of years. What was it? Carl, Buck, Carl, what was his name? Sagan. Carl Sagan. Billions and billions of years ago. He's, he's, he's a believer now. You know that. He may not be in the right place, but he's a believer. Because people in hell, they know better. They know what the truth is. That there is a God. There is a creator. And so that's why I tongue-in-cheek say he's a believer. 
But that God that spoke the universe into existence put the stars in place that are always there. They're always in that spot, amen? Just like our sun is always where it's supposed to be. All the planets, not just in our solar system, but all throughout the universe, all rotate in just the way that they are supposed to at the proper distance from the stun, the, their sun. And everything performs just like a huge watch. Perfectly. And it has to be that way in order for there to be life on Earth. Because if something gets out of whack way out there, then you got the domino effect all the way here. Amen? There's a bunch of things that have to happen here. And our, and our solar system, in order for there to be life on Earth, there can't haphazardly be life on Earth. And, and, and finding water on another planet doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference. You know, it's, who cares, you know, if there's water on Mars? Who cares? There's ice. If there's ice, there has to be water. So what? Doesn't mean that uh, there's some amoeba up there waiting to become a human, you know? doesn't mean nothing. We have the evidence of the written word of God that bears truth to the living word of God, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you cannot discount the person of Jesus. You cannot discount who he is or who he, he was when he was in this flesh on this planet. There's many prophecies that were fulfilled by him. The life that he lived, he lived a life that no man has ever been able to live. And it, and it is an insult to try to compare Jesus Christ to Magat Mahande, or Buddha, or, or Reverend Sun Yun Moon, and don't even call him Reverend, that's blasphemy to say that. And any one of these religious leaders that have come along, you can't compare them. You can't compare Jesus among the gods because none of the gods compare to our God. Amen? It's an insult to our God to even try to compare. And so this God that created it all, that breathed breath in the life of Adam after he formed him out of the dust of the ground, he breathed into the nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And then he said, listen, man's not complete. He goes all through creating all this stuff, right? Man's not complete. And he puts Adam into a deep sleep and he takes a rib from his side. And he forms a woman. Bone of my bone. Flesh of my flesh. Us married couples need to get that ingrained in our mind. It's no longer two different lives. It's one. Amen. Bone of my bone. Flesh of my flesh. And the first time he said, eyes on Eve, he said, whoa, man. Are you slow in catching that? <laughs> like, no, he said woman. What? Yeah, break it up. Whoa, man. She was that beautiful. She's knocked out gorgeous. Whoa, man. You know, we read it woman. <laughs> but the, God did this. God put in place everything that they would need for survival. Every tree they could eat of, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the only one they couldn't touch. Every need that they could ever possibly have was met. And they would walk with God and talk with God. And it was absolutely wonderful. And God had a plan. Multiply and replenish the earth and uh, have dominion over all of my creation. And then one day, the snake slid into the garden and he said, yea, hath God said. Starts by creating doubt in God's word. And might I add, that's what's happening today. With our plethora of new versions, there's doubt, casting doubt on God's word. It's not making it plainer or clearer. Things that are different are not the same. And uh, to just put it simply, the 1881 critical text it's known as the critical text today. It's been revamped, but it's still the same old critical text. And there's the received text. The critical text is where all new versions come from. The received text is where the King James Bible comes from. These Greek manuscripts are not in agreement. 
That's why there's differences. This has been blessed by God for many centuries. And this was the Bible that was used in every biblical revival that has ever taken place in the English-speaking world. Amen? And so this is the one that has had and continues to have God's breath upon it. And there's a good reason for it. It comes from a different source. But it casts doubt in what has God said. And he got Eve confused about the tree. Yeah, has God said. You, can, you cannot eat of every tree of the garden. Yeah, we can eat every tree. We can't do this or that. We can't touch it. God never said you couldn't touch it. He just said you couldn't eat it. You know? But isn't it amazing that when, when we try to defend God, we always go further than we need to and end up going into error and heresy? Yeah, that's what happens, you know? Just stick with what the book says and don't add to it. Don't take from it. Just do what it says it says. What it doesn't say, then don't make something up or don't try to comment on something we really don't know. Just go by what it says. Now, evidently, God didn't want us to know it or he would have put it in his book. Okay? But long story cut short, Eve uh, partakes uh, of this forbidden fruit. We don't know what it, what, what it was. Everybody talks about an apple. Doesn't say that. Just said it was a, that fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I want you to understand because don't be picking on Eve too quickly because it says, and she gave, gave, uh, gave it on to her, uh, her what did it say, her husband that was with her? I don't think it says Adam was with her, but her husband. Either way, however it's worded there, he was there, amen, and he knew what he was doing. The New Testament said that she was deceived, but Adam did it willfully, amen. So don't get too critical of Adam because he was representative of the human race. In other words, whatever Adam did, you would have done the same thing if you were Adam. And God knew all this. He knew that this was going to happen. He knew that before he created the foundation of the world, that Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, was going to have to come and die for the sins of humanity before humanity was even created. He knew that that was going to happen. But why does he do it? His love. I can't understand that. I can't explain it. But his love. His love for us. He certainly doesn't need us, but for whatever reason, he wants us. Amen? I mean, that should make us feel good. And so, Jesus has to come and shed his innocent blood that we might be forgiven, that we might be justified, which means declared righteous. I absolutely cannot stand when anybody tries to say that justified means just as if I never sinned. Why? Because you did sin. You did sin. You were guilty. And in that state of being guilty, God declared you not guilty. He declared you righteous. So don't go with this just as if I never said, oh, be so happy with yourself. No, be embarrassed with yourself to even consider such a thought. You did sin multiple times you had sinned. And yet in that sinful state, God has chosen by the sacrifice of his son to declare you righteous. And when God looks at you, he looks at his son. He sees you through the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. Not your good works, not your sweat and tears, the blood of his son. Amen? And so as we come to this passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians 11, and, and uh, G, uh, the, the church at Corinth is a church that uh, has a multitude of problems. They even had a problem in the area of the Lord's Supper. And so everything that Paul addresses uh, in the book of Corinthians, it's not because, uh, you know, he's really happy with them and he's giving them some added instruction. No, it's that they've messed everything up and he's trying to straighten it out. Uh, one, one, of the pa one of the preachers at the prayer advance said something that I often thought, why in the world would anybody that knows the Bible name their church Corinthian Baptist Church? I mean, that's horrible, hey, Amen. Don't ever name the church that. This church had it all messed up, and that's why Paul has to write. And one of the things they had messed up was the Lord's Supper. 
Now, we're not going to look at everything he says about the Lord's Supper uh, from about uh, verse 17, I believe it is, down to verse 34. We're only going to look at the section where he talks about the actual elements of the Lord's Supper, what they represent. And so in verse 23, the Word of God tells us, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. I delivered unto you. He, he told them this in the past. I delivered unto you. He received what he's telling them from the Lord. He didn't receive this from Peter, James, or somebody else. He received this directly from the Lord because Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. The apostles had special revelations that were given to them that aren't just given to everybody. Amen? And so the Lord Jesus met with Paul on several occasions. Now, Paul in 2 Corinthians says, because of the abundance of the revelations that were given unto me, he ended up getting a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble. Amen? And so he received this from the Lord. So this is directly, what he's saying is directly from the Lord himself. Because Paul wasn't even saved when this happened. When the Lord's Supper was instituted, Paul wasn't a Christian. He was a Pharisee. Christianity, for many years to come from this point, was far from Paul's thinking. As all he wanted to do was destroy Christianity, stamp it out. And then God got a hold of his heart. And then with the fierceness with, he, with, with which he tried to destroy Christianity, that same fierceness was now shown in his desire to advance the gospel. Amen. And boy, if we could have only could only get the gospel out like Paul has. And the churches that Paul started in a brief period of time. The scripture that God used him to give to us, mightily, mightily used of the Lord in, in, in a great way. And, and the reason why you can't get your reward when you get to heaven is because you, God's got to let everything play out. Paul is still getting rewards for what's going on in our hearts today because of his ministry. You know that? And so people that will be touched by you after you have died, uh, that's fruit to your account. That, that, that's, uh, that's rewards that, that, that are going to be added to whatever rewards that you get now while you're living. And so everything's got to be done before God can give us our rewards because it ain't all said and done. The opposite is true, too. The effects that Darwin and Hitler have had on society, they are going to answer for that even though they're no longer alive. It's their fault what the unbelief that exists today lies in their lap, and that is something that they will give an account for. They will be beaten with many stripes. All right, so he says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, which he was betrayed, let that think sink in a little. He was betrayed. Don't you hate being betrayed by somebody? And we're just... Really, we're just like insignificant humans. We hate being betrayed. Here's the Lord of glory that has did nothing but love people. And he's betrayed. He was betrayed by one of his own disciples. He's betrayed by a kiss from his own disciple. But Jesus never stopped calling him, my friend. Amen. Is Judas in heaven? No, he's not. He went to his place. He went to hell. Amen. Not because he betrayed him, but because he never received Christ as the true Messiah of Israel. Amen? He died without his sins ever being forgiven. He died under guilt. Peter was raised up under conviction. Remember this morning I said the difference between guilt and conviction, right? Guilt is meant to crush you by Satan, but conviction is meant to deliver you. Peter denies the Lord. He goes out and he whips bitterly, but in that weeping, in that conviction, it leads him to greater things. Amen? Forgiveness of sin and greater things. Uh, what happens to uh, uh, Judas? He is crushed by that guilt. He never turns to Christ for forgiveness. And he dies and goes to the devil's hell. So that same night in which he was betrayed, took bread... And so this is going to be symbolic. 
Obviously, the bread can't be the actual body of Jesus because the body of Jesus is sitting there, amen? So right from the beginning, this was only ever meant to be symbolic. It's teaching us something. It's a foundational truth. He says this body, he said, uh, uh, that same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And it's in reference to his torn flesh. In fact, Hebrews 10 makes that clear when it talks about uh, entering the veil through his flesh, the tornness of his flesh. Amen? His flesh was torn for us. It's not his bones because not a bone in him was broken. That fulfilled the prophecy. But his flesh was torn. Is ripped open. You could see his vital organs if you were there at the cross. It was absolutely horrible. It was a horrendous sight. He was ripped to shreds. There's just nothing left to him. But no man took his life because he says, no man takes my life, I give my life. So when it was finished, then he said, it is finished. Nobody decided that but him. It was finished. But he was torn and his blood was shed. Take eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. It's a memorial. You're doing this in remembrance of him. In every account of the Lord's Supper, it says the same thing. It's a remembrance. It's a memorial. And why theologians want to debate, is this the actual body of Jesus? Or, oh no, the presence, it's not his actual body, but his presence is in the elements. None of that is true. Just read your Bible and believe it. It's symbolic. It's a remembrance. It represents something. It doesn't, doesn't become something. You can't say hocus pocus and there it is. No, it doesn't work that way. In fact, the word hocus pocus comes from the word that the priest would say when they would turn the the wafer into the body of Christ, they would turn the, the, well, they would use wine, and they turn the wine into the blood of Jesus. That's the word, the word, the Latin word that they use is where we would later get the word hocus pocus. That's exactly what it is. It does, nothing happens, amen? And then the reformers would come up with their brand of teaching. Well, his presence is there. No, his presence isn't there. His presence is in you. Amen? Christ dwells in our heart by faith. His presence is in you. That's where his presence is. So he says, do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup and consistently when it's talking about the Lord's Supper it says cup or fruit of the vine. It never says wine. Why? Because these elements are to be on leavened bread and on fermented grape juice. Why? Because they represent the sinless body and blood of Jesus. Amen? And so therefore, they must be kept that way. And so it says the cup. It doesn't say the wine. It says the cup. So after this manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament. Literally, it's, it's the New Covenant. We're under a New Covenant now. The Old Covenant law is past. Read about it. It talks about it uh, in 2 Corinthians. It talks about it in Hebrews. We're under a New Covenant now. And I don't understand why Christians are so infatuated with trying to get us under the Old Covenant. Why? We don't belong there. We belong under the New Covenant. Amen? Which Hebrews says is a far better covenant. And so it's a covenant not built on what I do, but built on what he has done. The old covenant blessings were based on your obedience. I, I did what, I, what the law tells me to do. I get blessings. If I don't, I get cursings. That's what Deuteronomy 28 is about. These TV preachers seem to like preaching Deuteronomy 28, but only the blessing side of it. They don't, they don't preach the cursing side of it. Well, they shouldn't preach any of it as applying it to the, to the church because it doesn't apply to us. Amen? We're similar to the Abrahamic covenant, which is an unconditional covenant given to Abraham 
God put Abraham asleep on purpose when he walked between the, ple- the pieces of the cut animals because the covenant he was making with Abraham had nothing to do with Abraham's behavior and how righteous Abraham was. It all was on God. Amen? He took it upon himself. And as you read from the time that God made that covenant with Abraham, Abraham messed up quite a bit. Thank God the covenant wasn't based on him. It was based on God. It's, the un, it's called an unconditional covenant in theology. The New Testament is an unconditional, uh, unconditional covenant because it's based on what Jesus Christ did on the cross by himself. Nobody was up there helping him out. He did it all by himself. He was divided and cut up for us. He shed his blood for us. And whosoever will may come. Whoever. You can make, put your name in there. Whoever you are, put your name in there. Whosoever will may come. Amen? And it's simply by the grace of God. God's unmerited favor. You just trust the Lord. God have mercy upon me, a sinner. My trust is in him. And I'm kept by that covenant. Amen. Amen. And so after the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. He says it again in case you forgot the first time. In remembrance of me. So we have the, these elements, the unleavened bread, and the grape juice, and they represent Jesus' torn flesh and Jesus' shed blood. And this is all what he has done. And forgive me for the analogy. If it's inappropriate, forgive me. But in sense, it's like Jesus saying, gentlemen, ladies, this is a football. He's bringing us back to the basics. Only he's referring to his body and his blood. This is the gospel. The death, burial, the resurrection. This is what everything is based upon. This is what everything is built upon. This is it, right here. And then he says these words in verse 26. As often as you eat this bread. That means whenever you do it. So you don't have to do it once a week. You don't have to do it once a month. You don't have to do it once a week. Whatever, whatever a church decides on, that's, that's church business. We do it every month that has five Sundays in it, right? It works, amen. But when we do it, what is happening? He says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death. See, see, this is a demonstration. This, this, is, this is an enactment. This is a, a reenactment of what happened. This is him giving himself. This is the fundamentals. This is the basics. This is what happened. And as often as you do this, you do show the Lord's death till he come. So it's not just a looking back, but it's a looking forward because you do this until he come. He's coming back, amen? And just because it's been 2,000 years and he hasn't come back yet, it doesn't mean he's not coming back. It just means we're that much closer to it. And as we look at this world that we lived in, there is no no time in history that you can look back to and say that the world then is like it is now because it's all globally. The world then affects certain parts of the world. When, When you think about what was going on in the Roman Empire, that was the Roman Empire. There were other countries that the Bible doesn't talk about that were in existence at the time. There were other empires. But Rome was the main one in that area of the world. And so now we're living in a time where everything is global. It's globally happening. All over, everywhere. Absolutely incredible what is happening. Even in the world of entertainment. There used to be a time not too long ago when some of you were small children where where the culture in Japan had their own entertainment, their own culture, their own type of music. But now, not, and this ain't recent, this has been going on for a while, now the entertainment in Japan is the same as in America, is the same as in Europe. It's all the same. Same music, same style of music, same style of clothes. 
You know, we complain, well, we used to years ago. I don't think it's so much of a, of a thing today. But remember when guys wore their pants down around their knees and everything was showing? Come on now. I'm not the only one that can remember seeing that. How could you forget? Amen? I said, man, the kid needs to pull his pants up. I told a kid working at Walmart, I said, dude, you need to get a, a belt that fits. And he said, no, it fits. I said, no, it doesn't. It's twice the size of what you need. He says, no, it's just right. He said, I might need a bigger one. It's unbelievable, no. Nah. But they weren't just, just doing that in America. They were doing it in Europe, doing it in Japan, doing it everywhere. Canada. So, so here we are. We're in a time where everything's global. Everything that's happening is global. Where everything is globally connected. And I remember when you didn't have this, right? But there's more technology in my hand than what sent the first... Uh, loon uh, uh, spaceman to the moon. What, what, what was that? Uh, Apollo, Apollo 11 went to the moon. There's more technology right here than what they had in sending that to the moon. And, they, and then the computers were like the size of the room. But now, oh, look at this. Look at this. I, I told Pamela, I, I said it's hard to believe things that sometimes because how is it that I could dial a number in this cell phone, call the other side of the world, have what I'm saying go off a satellite, go to that person that I'm calling, and we're talking to each other without any breaks. Ain't that absolutely amazing? It seems impossible. And there's no wires connected to it. I remember when I was a kid, the telephone had to have a wire. Remember extra long extension cords? <laughs> Cindy's shaking her head. I, re I remember that. Man, them things were used. I remember the first remote control. It still had a cord attached to the TV, and you still had to do it. I remember when uh, cable first came in. Before that, it was hold the antenna, change, move the antenna when Dad said. I'm old school. And some of you go back to when it was uh, before there was a television. There was a radio. And I don't think anybody in here goes back to before there was a radio. <laughs> but, uh, but it's amazing, isn't it? What was that? John, John might, no. I know when John was born, they had radios then. But, uh, but now, in a short period of time, we've got these incredible little devices. We're globally connected. What happens in one part of the world affects the whole world. He says, you observe the Lord's Supper how long until he comes. And he's getting close. Amen. So the Lord's Supper, we don't just look back and see the drama out, played out before us in our, our minds as we think of the body and the blood. But we also see the propheticness of this, that he left with the promise that he would return and in the day in which we are living, it is closer now than it has ever, ever been. Amen? And so who knows? I'm all right with going right now. I don't know about you guys, but if the rapture were to happen and the, the horn were to sound, I'm not going to say, wait a second. Well, you can't say, wait a second, because in a nanosecond, you're out of here. <laughs> so it's happened before you know it, you're just looking at the Lord. One minute you're looking at me, the next nanosecond you're looking at Jesus. Wow, Pastor Bob. <laughs> no. Talk about the Mount of Transfiguration. No, I am not the Lord. Never will be, never come close to. Amen. But someday that is going to happen. And so until then, we show the Lord's death till he comes. Now later on in this chapter, it talks about examine yourself. And, and we need to do that. We need to have a, a time of self-examination, amen? And, uh, and you'll, you know, how are things between us and the Lord? How are things going, amen? How, how's that working out for you? Um, you need to examine yourself. You, you know, I mean, there's some stern warnings here about some that have taken the Lord's Supper evidently without examining themselves and Verse 30 says, for this cause, many, that's a lot of people, not just a few, that's a lot. Many are weak and sickly, 
So some are sick and getting sicker among you, and many sleep, many have died. Why, how did they die? They took the Lord's Supper with a sin in their life that they were not willing to deal with, amen? And the sin primarily was of a relationship, because back earlier, when he's talking about the Lord's Supper and the part that we didn't cover, they were despising the church of God. They were despising one another. And we're living in a day where that's become true in the time in which we live amongst Christians. We, we despise one another. We don't get along like we're supposed to. We don't love one another like we're supposed to. And yet we approach the Lord's table like it's no big deal. Then we wonder why there's so many sick and dying and dead on the prayer list. Right? Interesting. I'm going to close in a word of prayer, but I just I came across this today. I just want to read it to you because it's really good with the Lord's Supper. And it simply says this, When Jesus Christ cried, it is finished. Righteousness was perfected. Divine justice was satisfied. Blood was shed. Redemption was paid. Sins were forgiven. Reconciliation was achieved. Death was conquered and salvation was secure. All in that phrase, it is finished. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for these few moments we could spend in your word. I just pray that you would take the words of a feeble preacher and use them for your glory and honor. Please, Father, touch hearts and draw us closer to yourself. And be with us now, Father, as we observe the Lord's Supper. May we honor you in it, and may we glorify you. In Jesus' most precious and holy name I pray. Amen. All right, Jeremy, if you'll lead us in the hymn of invitation, Cindy will play for us. And as we, and if everybody will, will stand and take your hymnal, turn to hymn number what hymn? 318. And if the Lord has spoken to your heart in any way, now is your time to come and talk to the Lord, and, and then when we're done with the invitation hymn, then we'll partake of the Lord's Supper. But if the Lord's spoken to your heart, I want to caution to you, act upon it. Don't just, oh, I'm going to take the Lord's Supper and see what. Uh, don't approach it that way, please. All right. Are you going to need this?